Okay, my name is uh, Jesse Young and I have been the director and slash president of the Community Baboon Sanctuary since 1998. Um, the group it consists of members of an elected woman from each of the seven villages that comprise the CBS. We hold annual general meetings, we have our bylaws, our memorandum of understanding that we operate by. Established in um, on February 23rd, 1985, by a primatologist from Gaysville, Wisconsin, Dr. Robert Cowich. And um, after doing research in Mexico and Guatemala, he found out that uh, Belize had some monkeys. Um, he saw a film done by Richard and Harold Foster in the same community here um, on the monkeys, and so that brought him to Belize. To the monkeys and soon found out that we had more monkeys than Guatemala and Costa Rica. And so um, he went around the community, then he found this local guy who was the chairman of the community at the time. Um, it's like the little government that runs the affairs of the village. Um, his name was Falik Young. And so they went around to the communities um, telling them about an idea, about a sanctuary. And at that same very first village meeting, 12 landowners from this community signed up. Um, Harwich then went around with uh, Palette Young to the other communities and um, they all had other landowners signed up. And so uh, today we have like 240 members. very instrumental um, being the first manager of the sanctuary in getting the uh, people to sign on to the pledges. Um, I guess it was his personality of knowing how to work with people and so um, people readily signed on to it. Um, since then uh, it was managed by Belize Arbon Society in the first years but later on in 1995 um, due to financial constraint, the Belize Audubon Society could no longer um, administer the affairs and so local committees were formed. And again, Mr. Young thought that that was the best thing and so he went around and encouraged people to, to form a committee and, um, and so the sanctuary has been, manage, been managed by local committee since then. Um, it was usually by men and then in 1998, um, the sanctuary had its share of problems. And so Mr. Young decided that why don't you form a women's group and try to take over the affairs of the sanctuary. And I said, you know what, that is a very good idea. And so I did and I, I, um, I called a meeting in different communities and um, People agreed and that was how the women's conservation group that is managing the sanctuary today got started. Um, that was in 1998 and we are still here today. Uh, we have our share of problems like any other conservation organization I guess but um, we have been able to achieve a lot for the um, communities, the landowners. Um, we soon realized that if the community is not benefiting in some way or the other, conservation will be useless in the later run. So uh, we decided to um, embark on some more meetings with our communities and ask them like questions like, what, can, what would you like to see the CBS do for you? And they came up with different project ideas and so we do, did the proposal, we got the funding for alternative livelihoods. Um, such as uh, tilapia farming, backyard tilapia farming, which is really environmentally friendly because 
where the ponds are located. It's not near any waterways where runoffs will be going into the river and the water that they use from the pond, they use to fertilize their vegetables. So they have organic vegetables growing right around their ponds. We did um, organic chickens. Um, we buy the same vegetables, the corn that the, that the farmers farm. We bought those to feed the chickens. Um, and so they are grown organically. We have, uh, we did um, pigs as well for some of the farmers. So totally there is like 45 families that have benefited from those projects um, in this area. We have also did a number of trainings for um, landowners like in land management practices and good farming practices, uh, the effects of uh, slash and burn and the shifting of agriculture and so we have been um, empowering our people uh, we do like an annual summer program for 150 kids um, we do like scholarships to the needy children in the and that goes to the BRHS or maybe in the East city um, and I'm proud to say that even though it's not a lot of money, 90% of the income that comes into the CBS just passes through our hands because it goes directly to the communities um, for services such as tour guiding, um, bed and breakfast, um, catering for food, um, rental of canoe, rental of horses, etc. So those monies just pass through our hands. And so um, I'm proud to say that the community, it's really a community effort and they're benefiting from, from this um, project. Because we depend on tourism for everything here. We are not getting any subsistence from government or anyone. So we depend solely on the entrance fee that is paid here for our survival. And during the months of, um, like from May to October, many times our staff work for no pay at all. They just volunteer their time. Um, and with the recession and the global economy problems right now, it's very hard for somebody to just volunteer their time because then they have their family to feed um, and so it's becoming very difficult and as a community-based organization I'm one of the oldest in the Belize um, I, I have been speaking to other CBOs and they are facing the same problem as we do and so um, we have to try and find an avenue out of this and how we could try to sustain at least the project managers for so that the projects can continue. So that's a challenge for us um, that we need to, to uh, do down the road. Uh, we have also um, been like the mother organization over smaller CBOs within the River Valley. The Dauntless Designers Women's Group in Doublehead Cabbage, we have been able to um, access funding for them through the, the Global Environmental Facility and the UNDP. To, um, so they do um, food preservatives, they do um, embroidery, you could get a nice pair of um, bed covering with a wildlife or a bird or a monkey um, embroidery in it. Um, they do yoga bags from recycled stuff. Um, and then the, the Flowers Bank community group, they are starting to construct a, a cocoon mill to process cocoon oil in Flowers Bank. And so that's our goal for every community that are members of the CBS to have their own little projects going on within their communities um, in order to sustain them. So that's the goal that we are working on. We have recently completed a marketing plan that includes all the communities in the Belize River Valley, including Rancho Dolores and Lemonal, because they border, um, Lemonal borders Crooked Tree Wildlife Sanctuary and Rancho is, they have their own wildlife sanctuary there, but they are young and um, so we are kind of taking the leadership role and assisting them. 
and so um, now we need to find money to implement that marketing plan and so that's where we are with that um, and these plans have been identified by the community themselves we just incorporate them and, and um, do them so if we could find funding to implement that plan that would be a good thing I'm also looking at um, like a seeking funds for a commercial market in one central location where the farmers, the, the entrepreneurs, um, everybody could come out and sell their products. Like maybe Tuesday, Thursday, it's Belize River Valley Market Day, everybody will bring their stuff here and we will do the promotion and everything for them so that they could sell their, their stuff there. So that's another um, project that um, we are working on as well. It's kind of difficult for CBOs like us to find funding because we, the, we cannot go to the banks. The banks will not lend groups like us money. So we, we depend really, really on grants, on funding agency out there to, to, um, to support us with those kind of funding. Mm -hmm. so we have also um, started a, a scholarship fund in the name of uh, Fallet Young. Um, we really wanted to have it already by this school year that will be starting in September, the new school year. But unfortunately, there was a lot of uh, little things to do to get it set up. Like you had to get the legal part of it done, the board of directors who will sit on it and all those things. And um, I think time really rode, us, rode upon us. So um, we will definitely be focusing on that this year and see how much we can grow that fund so we could assist um, students um, mainly in natural resource management from this area. So we want to keep his name alive. He has done so much for conservation. So. I just I was at a workshop yesterday for CBOs and it was um, the Protected Area Conservation Trust, which was designed for protected areas management, and they wanted to know um, how they could assist the CBOs. So I think that might be a positive way um, in finding funding for protected area managers and CBOs because, like. As we said in Belize, like the larger NGO, they do a better job at, at, at policies mm -hmm. and, and focus mainly on conservation, mm -hmm. while the community-based organization that lives in the community have to do the groundwork and, and live with the people there. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very critical for us as CBOs because we live in the community and we know the needs of the community. And so um, I think it's an area, even the government of Belize now is focusing on community-based organization, not only in conservation, but in other areas um, to see how, how they could empower more of them to, mm -hmm. to carry out the programs and, and projects of the <laughs> The Women's Conservation Group, um, we meet monthly, and so when we come to the table, the, the respective representative go back to their community and they bring whatever is the issue or the um, problems, whatever, to the table when we meet again, and so we see how we can address those, and so we meet regularly to mm -hmm. try and over here you could take a look at our country national tree, which is a mahogany tree. And it takes about 75 to 100 years for a mahogany to reach its maturity. At that point, mahogany should be carrying buttresses roots up to about 6 foot 6 tall. In the in inception um, of the sanctuary, the little pledges that were presented to the landowners 
um, was to like leave um, strips of property between their um, bottom, um, like a boundary between their properties when they were like clearing for mail pot or so on. Say for example, if you live 66 feet and I live leave 66 feet, um, that would form enough uh, pathway for the monkeys to, to roam freely and not only the monkeys, other wildlife. Um, again, this was one of Mr. Young's idea. Um, when the road was constructed, um, monkeys were being killed either by dogs or by cars coming in. And so he said, um, I wonder if we could maybe try and build like a aerial bridge across the road. Maybe that would help the monkeys. And, and so um, he designed it and everything with ropes and and, and it worked perfectly, not only for the monkeys, it took them a while to use it, but they eventually started to use it. And so um, we even saw the King Kanju using it one night. So it would, other wildlife use it as well. So that was a good thing. But now um, it's, uh, we, the, the sanctuary is not making enough money to maintain those things. So we had like little foot bridges on the trails, but they are, in need of repairs, um, monkey bridge need to be put in different locations and some need to be repaired. Um, because further down the road, if you would go, I just saw a dead monkey that was hit by a car going to the second bridge. And so there is really a need for other bridges to be placed in different locations, but the funding is just not there for them. And also we have asked the landowners to like, um, not clear cut the river banks um, for erosions mm -hmm. and even their crops mm -hmm. um, would lose that topsoil um, and they would get poor yields so to leave the forest along the river bank not to cut the trees the monkeys use for food um, and little things like those were what they signed on to when they um, were asked to sign the pledge for the monkeys. Now in front of us here you could take a look at a monkey crossing see so this little ladder here was built for the purpose of the monkeys to get across to the other part of its habitat, okay? It was split into two, yeah. Yeah, and they'll be coming across this sooner or later. Let me see if I find a troop of monkey in here, and as soon as I find them, I see if I get them to just make it across in front of your eyes so you could see them, okay? I'll be going right in here. you like um about a hundred and fifty dollars for one ju that's just for the road uh -huh. to, to be put across the road and then you have to get the poles um which will cost you about like twenty dollars each so that's like like four poles uh -huh. and the, the rope is like a hundred and fifty the little pieces of sticks you can get people uh -huh. usually volunteer their time to help mm -hmm. In fact, I think they got fun in building bridges, so it's only the materials. But for right now, um, I think we have identified like 20 bridges that we need to really put in, not only in this community, but in other communities. So. Come on, come, come. If you notice, they all use their prehensile tail, which works like a fifth hand to their body. And this is what helps them stabilize it within the limbs of trees and also to reach further out for food. <coughs> troop normally ranges from 2 up to 11. And the way troop are made up, it's of one dominant male, maybe having two or three wives. The others will be sub. The others will be sub adult, juveniles, and infant babies. After a male or a female reaches maturity and ready for mating, they will be pulled out of the troop by the dominant male. They got to go find themselves a mating partner and establish themselves a territory. Male reaches maturity within the age of five to seven. Female from three to five years. Because we can constantly have to um, repair them. I think a bridge, um, if it's made with the right rope, because what happened, we had to use smaller ropes because it's cheaper but if it's used with the right rope you can have it for eight nine years one bridge would last that long yeah so
It's, it's, um, it, it's very terrible when you find like a dead monkey hit by a car and, and the people are so um, concerned because people would come all the way here and say, you know what, I saw a dead monkey down the road, it was hit by a car and, and you know, so people are concerned about the monkeys, um, what happened to them here. So um, I'm sure the community would come out and help with the bridge. It's not a problem to build it, it's just the materials. Hi. What 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 happened with before you built the bridge here? Uh, two of the two pinards, they were killed by dogs because they were forced to use it to ground. So I built the bridge and I hung it up across there. Now and they use it to go back and forth, so we have no more accidents again. I'm just happy also to say that. Today we still have like 90% of the farmers still abiding by their management um, pledge that they had signed. Um, we have seen people stop doing milk now. In several of the communities there are only a few people still doing their little slash and burn. Um, we have had like the, um, the crested guan that is back in the CBS. We have the oscillated turkey that is back in the CBS. Not much, but they were spotted. And so those were extinct here, but now they are coming back. So that's a good sign. Um, they are really doing a good job at it. So it, it's good to, to encourage them. So as incentives, that's why we try to do these alternative livelihood projects to, to encourage them, you know, to, um, to want to conserve more.